So yeah, these are our names. I'm Alessian and he's Christian. We are both from Queen Mary University. We are PhD researchers and um, we work with sound. My background is in architecture and his background is in sound design. So um, I am interested in space and how space is used and how sound actually is part of this kind of use of the space. And so we'd like to present you uh, some of the projects we are working on um, and some we are worked on previously and some future uh, directions as well. Um, so there's a, an important component that is the um, design methodology for this kind of objects which are very physical and the, the way to be played it really depends by how they are designed and how the sound is designed as well. So we're going to talk about uh, the technology we use for, for these objects. So the first um, creation is a, is a broom. So um, there's an Arduino which is controlling all the input from the sensors uh, on this broom, including an accelerometer and an embedded speaker. And the idea was to create a, a sensitive object which could interact with the space and was an everyday object which every person could use. Uh, but I was mostly interested in how uh, the interaction with the floor and the space could come out of the expressivity of the instrument. So I tested this Mozi library for real-time audio on Arduino. And, and later I changed a bit the design of the interaction, including a distance sensor to control the pitch and some kind of gesture sensing as well. And you can see some examples from the video, hopefully. <laughs> so there was an FM modulator as well. And so the, the orientation of the stick of the broom was controlling the, the frequency of the synthesizer. And after this experiment, I went into like trying different time from, for this instrument. But I was really interested in what people could think if you actually play an instrument like this in a normal house and what can happen. So I had many interesting uh, opinions from my musicians' friends, which thought I was a bit crazy. But, okay. So after, <laughs> oh. um, can you go back to the Very right fun. one? Oh, sorry. Cool. Yeah. Okay. So, yeah. I already said that. The second experiment was Odette uh, with Lida Teodoru, and in this case, we wanted to experiment with um, kind of skeleton tracking from Kinect, and we wanted to create uh, an alter ego uh, mirroring a movement of um, a user. Uh, and in this case, the user had to become part of this kind of dialogue, this uh, performative interaction in front of this image. Uh, so the participant in this case was becoming um, the puppet master, in a sense, and the, um, the shadow created by the object and the lights and also the sound uh, was part of the performance. So when people could come and see this scene, they were thinking, what, what's going on? And they wanted to be part of this kind of dialogue. And the interesting thing is that uh, the object was kind of fascinating, in a sense, but also made by a very common material, such as bubble wrap. It was clearly a closed hangar with an Arduino and some servo motors, which also produced sound, which was very creepy. And the sound I decided to program in Super Collider, I used uh, an already existing uh, flute uh, patch, but it was creating kind of different pitch sounds. So when you were waving your, your arms uh, in the air, then you were creating like spooky sounds, kind of airy. Um, we also have a video uh, to show this next one. So it really seemed like a ghost for everyone. <laughs> Funny enough, that. <laughs> and it was really 
like, in terms of understanding how I was working, it was really clear to, to see all the connection, which was also part of the, of the design of the, of the piece. In this case, the, like, the... Um, In this case, the Kinect was uh, in a black box uh, below the, the wings. So we used to call them kinetic wings at the beginning. So we were experimenting with kind of responsive structures. Um, and then we decided to like, play a bit on this kind of personification of the character playing in front of you. You were also animating. And we use OpenNI for the Kinect libraries and processing. So processing was sending serial messages to Arduino. Um, and from this, I will leave like the. Hey. Okay, so I'm gonna talk about this one briefly now. Uh, so this instrument is called the Air Harp. Um, so the idea behind the air harp was that it was it originally started out as a mystery box project. So the idea was that you had a box on the table and it was all up to the person interacting with the box to figure out how to play this instrument. Um, and I really wanted to design something that allowed the person to make music, pick it up and make music within less than 10 seconds, basically. Um, so this is the way that you interact with the instrument. Um, I'll actually try and give you a live demo first. So basically it's completely embedded, so battery, speakers, and all this are in the box. And there are nine physically modeled strings uh, going across the length of the box. And then there's some physics simulation which uh, changes the position of the string uh, of the object, which in turn plucks the strings based on the orientation of the device. So. The idea is that the interaction should be very, very natural um, and very easy to understand. This is also the second generation of the Air Harp where we laser cut this, this uh, nice front panel. The reason we did this actually was to let the sound come out of the box because initially we just had one single F hole on the front and that was nowhere near loud enough to amplify the instrument. Um, so here's just quickly how it works. Uh, we've got a virtual mass on two springs um, and as you tilt the box, we can derive the resulting gravity forces that we would need to push this mass across the strings. Um, and this is all there is to it, basically. Um, and here's just a picture of the inside. We've got a single accelerometer, uh, a Bella board, which I'll come back to later, uh, a battery and two speakers, and a line out, and a potentiometer that does nothing. OK. Um, I think I just went through all of this. Okay, so um, physical, physical modeling of sound is really useful for this kind of thing because it does a lot of the work for you. You just tell it, um, I'm gonna put in this much force and it's gonna behave exactly how I expect it to within the constraints of this physical simulation. But I found, especially coming from a sound design background, that this is often not enough, and I wanted to be able to perform environmental sound as if I was performing an instrument. Um, so here's a picture of somebody spraying WD-40 on a door hinge. And I say, no, don't do that, because I can use it for making synthesizers. So the idea with this project was to um, use a trackpad to like, a very simple input mechanism to produce squeaky door sounds. Um, so there are two approaches you can take. You can either physically model the entire system. Um, here are some papers that use uh, equations derived from tectonic seismic research to uh, produce the sound of friction. Uh, I took a different approach to this, uh, which is to, to kind of approach the sound of a door like a synthesizer, kind of like a modular synthesizer, um, where Instead of thinking about physical processes, you're thinking about oscillators and filters, and you name your parameters according to what 
you think it sounds like, and it's a bit of a iterative design process. So this is the block diagram of our squeaky door model. Uh, we've got an impulse train generator, some amplitude modulation, a bunch of bandpass filters and resonators. Um, and I should say this model was uh, developed based on Andy Farnell's uh, prototype. So I'll just play a video of this. So over here, you can see the trackpad position, the position of my finger as I played it. And here you can see the parameters moving and how they are mapped to the parameters. One more. Okay, I won't play the whole video, but you can look it up later, watch it yourself. Um, okay, that's the wrong title. Basically, um, so the model was designed in pure data, and um, we used touch size from a surface to control the model. Um, and the main thing here is that if you want to perform environmental sound, don't necessarily go for a physics simulation uh, and think about it more like a synthesizer. And I'll just hand over back to Alessia. So af after those uh, experiments you saw before, I decided to start being a, a serious person and do some like, kind of soundscape research. Uh, in, related to architecture, and so I decided in London to look at the area of Greenwich because of the architecture there, and the river, and a lot of green, and so I was interested in how um, a location which is quite known and used as a restorative uh, place by many people, including tourists, could be yeah. understood in a different way, uh, just because of its sound. And so I organized a sound walk, which is part of my PhD research, whose updates you can see at this link. And, and I decided to embed the recordings in an interactive object, and I decided to uh, use fabric for this. Um, the, the idea behind the fabric is that you can immerse yourself in this uh, situation recorded by someone else just touching the correspondent buildings. And this is possible because I used conductive thread and an embroidery machine we have, but it can be possible also just doing by hand. And so for every one of these places I associated one of the recordings I made. So um, this can be done uh, with Bella because Bella allows you to, to detect the, the touch and also to do some nice fading, which is very natural, uh, and it's what I wanted for this object. Because after the strange uh, sounds coming out of the first two pieces, I wanted something a bit more relaxing to be my part of my, my research. Uh, and so in this case, you have the surface of the fabric, which is kind of the conductive part you can touch, and then there's a layer of insulating fa fabric with some holes, and then the same capacity of part, uh, which is sensing the touch, goes to traces which go to this red ball, NPR one to one, and so I had to stitch all these wires uh, and put them in place there, and everything is going through I square C to Bella. And Chris helped me, like programming the code to, to read these things in real time, but it was amazing that everything could work just by plugging the cables because the fabric is actually really resistant compared to some other electronics. And so in this case, there's a, a strong meaning because I'm trying to look for interfaces that uh, I can bring to other uh, people which are not so familiar with what I'm researching, which is uh, sound and acoustics related to architecture and try to, to bring something intuitive to them. 
Um, this is also what, uh, like the methodology I've used for another project. Um, so I went uh, to China recently and we were supposed to create music boxes in a local village. So I was really interested in like uh, the sound, the environmental sound there because it was very relaxing with mountains and river, but also I was interested in the local music. So I decided to record these sounds from local people and my partner in, in this uh, project, Yi Shen, she wanted to have these uh, music boxes, very tiny objects projecting shadows, and this shadow was supposed to be the, the local decoration patterns that they also use uh, in weaving. And so after some research, the project had to be delivered in seven days, basically, and so I tried to find the, the easiest way to, to, to be able to have local people interacting with these objects and, and see their reactions. And so I use, in this case, Arduino and Adafruit uh, soundboard um, and an accelerometer. And so everything had to be embedded in this box, but the interaction should be like really straightforward. And it worked well because even kids could get it easily. I have no sound. <laughs> So they understood immediately there was this other feature you could connect to boxes and play another song just by sensing a magnet. And it was really interesting to go with these boxes in their spaces, in their like social relaxed spaces just used for gathering and talk about local affairs of a village and just sleep there or chat and relax. And they were really interested in hearing, of course, their music. And they said, this object is too simple for us. We want our, our decoration. You have to carve something on the sides because we, we don't really recognize this cube as something which is ours. Uh, so I needed to, to be helped by a girl, another design student, explaining what they were saying. And it was interesting to see how different people also were giving different advice uh, on the boxes. So they were saying embroidery is going to be really expensive. You, you don't have so much money for that amount of time. Um, yeah, so that's it basically. So you just rotate the side and change the song and then if you put it back to its original position, then it stops working. So it's, it's really a really simple thing, but I thought that for, in my case, it's important like, to, to do more in the research part, like gathering the right sounds and then mm, leaving the design to the minimum. Okay, then I will go back to the presentation, which is still like, somewhere. Yeah. Okay. Okay, I'll talk about the lightsaber in a second, but basically while Alessio is doing all this amazing soundscape research, um, I was uh, in my research group developing this board called Bela, which is an audio platform that works with the BeagleBone, an audio uh, framework really. Um, and this is what we've been using for lots of these projects we've been talking about basically. Um, so the nice thing about this board is that you've got extremely low latency uh, audio output, so that means if you press a button, it will take you less than uh, less than two milliseconds or less than a millisecond sometimes for the sound to come out of it, which is very fast. Um, and also the sensor bandwidth, the resolution is very high and the sensor, analog sensor sampling rate is very high as well, which is at audio rate. So this allows us to make some very, very uh, um, the objects with a very, very high level of expressivity in the interaction. So um, to demonstrate this, we built uh, a lightsaber. So you might notice that this lightsaber doesn't look like a lightsaber, it's just a cardboard tube. Um, and this is because we wanted to focus uh, only on the sound. We weren't interested in the, in the lights and so on. Um, so the way this works is we've got a billa inside one end of the tube um, and a battery. Um, and these are all the components that we're using. So we've got an accelerometer over here, uh, a piezo disc over here, 
speaker, our pillar board, and the battery. Um, so we use the piezo disc to detect hits on the sword. So when you're swinging the sword around and you hit it against the surface, it'll go, you know. Um, and as you move it around with the accelerometer, we uh, use that to, we integrated the accelerometer value to get a velocity reading, and we use that to produce the iconic lightsaber sounds. Um, and I'll just play a quick video, which I may skip through a little bit, which explains how this works. So the lightsaber is one of the most iconic sound effects. Everybody knows lightsaber from their childhood, and I'm just going to skip forward. Now these delay lines have a variable delay, so um, we're okay. So basically, uh, what we did was we um, okay, just go back here. Okay, so when Ben Burt uh, designed the lightsabers, what he did was he played the sound of a TV hum uh, coming through a speaker, and then he used a very long microphone, like a shotgun microphone. Uh, and recorded the output as he uh, imitated the swings of the uh, of the Jedi's with their lightsabers in the film, um, and uh, we replicated this process inside Pure Data. Um, are you all familiar with Pure Data? Uh, for those who aren't, it's basically a digital processing language, a visual language where you connect lots of components to each other with cables, um, and we can use this on Billa basically. Uh, so we reproduced this idea of Doppler effects, delay lines, and uh, uh, and movement using the PD patch, um, and then assembled it all inside the lightsaber cardboard tube. Um, unfortunately, we don't have that one with us to demo today. I'm just going to move straight on to here, which is. Um, I'll just quickly wrap up this, actually. So basically, um, what we're interested in is how does it feel to interact with a lightsaber when you have this low latency? What would it feel like if you actually had a lightsaber? What would it sound like, and so on? Um, and this is something that uh, was really made possible through the low latency and through the high bandwidth resolution sensor data. OK, so this is the final instrument we'll show you today, which is called, we call it the Vangelisizer. Um, also known as the shaker. Um, and the reason we called it the Vangelisizer was because we wanted to make an instrument that contained literally just an accelerometer, a bailout board, a speaker, and a battery. So something you could hold up. This thing over here. Um, something that you just requires the most minimal kind of interaction, basically. So. So to cut a long story short, basically, we started by making a synthesizer that emulated uh, Van Gaelis' soundtrack to Blade Runner and the synthesizer settings he had. Um, and then what we did then was we had a very iterative, rapid process of switching between the patch, uh, designing the sound, and designing the sensor mappings to the sound. Um, and because um, sound and sensor, you don't really distinguish between them when you're programming for a platform like this. Um, it made it very easy to prototype stuff very fast. Um, so basically what I'm trying to say with this one is that if you have very, very rapid, very iterative design, then you may end up with some strange results, but it will be very, very carefully designed because you've had very, very short iteration steps. Okay, so just to wrap it up, uh, here are some little nuggets of wisdom we thought we'd collected by um, working on these instruments. So A, keep it simple. Um, there's an enormous amount you can do with just one single sensor. Almost all of these uh, instruments we showed today work with one single sensor or two sensors. Um, and we find that constraints are often extremely useful in making an engaging experience. Also, um, have this desired experience in your mind when you design the instruments. Um, obviously, 
people will misuse it or use it in unexpected ways, but if you've got one design principle in mind, uh, then you'll come up with something very strong. Um, don't bias the focus just on the sensors or just on the synthesizer, but think of the whole instrument as a whole, um, and it will help. Otherwise, it's very easy to forget about, um, you know, how am I going to map the sensor range to this parameter, and oh, actually, it doesn't actually sound the way I expected it to, and so forth. Um, and finally, as I said before, make sure you're comfortable with your design and development environment, and make sure you have a fast, uh, the ability to have fast iterations. So the more quickly you can see the results of what you're prototyping, the better your results will be. And I think that is all of it from us. Thank you. Thank you very much. Can I just ask, is the next speaker in the room? Right, okay, if you want to come up, um, you could ask, if anybody's got one question that they want to ask, okay. this person here. Hi, uh, when you think about a, uh, a musical instrument, uh, one of the things about an instrument is predictability. I mean, I know if I do this thing, I will get this response each and every time, and that would enable me to perform and have the same thing happen several times. Most of the things you've shown me seem to be much more like, I don't know what's going to happen. I mean, could this be an instrument that someone could perform and consistently produce a repeated outcome? Mm -hmm. you want it? Sorry. Okay. okay, so, um, yeah. The instruments we showed there was an element of unpredictability, and they actually designed some of them on the principle of I am, I don't know what this thing is, but I want to be able to find out very quickly what it is. Um, because they're unpredictable in the first, in this discovery phase, doesn't mean that uh, they're incontrollable. It, it still means that you can learn how to use these instruments. So, for example, the Vangelizer, with the shaker. Um, a few days after we designed it, we realized, oh, we can do this twisty thing, and it sounds like a pizzicato string orchestra, basically. Um, and, this, and that is completely re repeatable, and the same applies to lots of the other instruments as well. Um, so I don't know if that answers the question, but basically, if you design it carefully, it will be controllable and repeatable. It may be strange, but it's repeatable, and you can become good at it. Um, so we're going to have these two instruments around if you want to play with them. Um, otherwise, thank you very much. <laughs>